This episode of Back to the Roots podcast is brought to you by Byron Seeds. The folks at Byron Seeds believe organic requires a different perspective, plan, and approach. Organic isn't simply a different type of product or even a different way of farming. It's a different way of thinking, planning, commitment. It's a different philosophy on how to feed the world. Many won't understand, but the people at Byron Seeds do. We're owned by organic dairy farmers. We not only have the product, but we plan, manage, and execute organic. We speak your language, we share your struggles, and we laud your successes. Organic isn't a way of doing business, it's a community. We learn from each other. We're in this together. We'd be glad to talk cropping plans, management systems, the road to profitability. We understand what you're trying to do. We're farmers just like you. Visit us at byronseeds.net or give us a call at 800-801-3596. And thanks to Byron Seeds. Regional farmer updates are also brought to you by Soil Biotics. Improve your soil health naturally with Soil Biotics Soil Boost. This is a dry, humic product that creates a looser soil, improves water infiltration, and increases nutrient retention so fewer inputs are needed. Soil Biotics is currently offering a special fall discount program for Soil Boost from October 1st through the end of November. Call the office at 815-929-1752 or inquire at SoilBiotics.com. update. So uh, uh, as far as the, the weather, um, July, uh, and for the most part, was mild for July. We had uh, a, a fair amount of moisture to keep everything going, and, and I believe I have yet to see the amount of green, lush pasture available in July as I have in uh, this past summer. And then in, in August, uh, the weather turned hot and humid, for about oh, I'd say the mid mid to late August, it was tough. Uh, we had uh, high humidity and temperatures in the uh, low to mid 90s, and uh, cows dropped off significantly in milk. And, and up until August, our milk production has been up throughout the region, uh, phenomenally, phenomenally up. So it was a fun fun time. Uh, and then in August, things dropped off. Uh, the cows just got lazy. It was just amazing. It was just, it was hard to get them up in the morning. They did not want to get up and go to the barn, and, and they were almost lethargic, it seemed. Uh, but we've come through that. Cows are coming back slowly. Uh, uh, the fly pressure was heavy all summer due to the the uh, extra moisture that we received, and uh, but that has tapered off just a tad bit now here in September. Why we've the weather has, has uh, calmed down a little bit. We're mostly in the low 60s, upper 50s at night, and weather the uh, temperature goes up to maybe the low 80s during the day, uh, bright sunshine. It's just, it's, it's great. Uh, and speaking of fly pressure, the, the, our, uh, our uh, fight against the fly pressure is a, is a mixture of the ectophyte uh, i believe it's a different name now but it's the agrodynamics ectophyte and we mix that with pygantic and some mineral oil and then we add some water and the ectophyte works as the repellent and the pygantic works as the killer the on on, on contact killer and the mineral oil is a sticker and uh that seems to work pretty good uh and I don't have the I don't have the exact recipe, but I'm sure Agrodynamics does have that and willing to share that with you if if you like that. So uh, right now on the farm here, uh, we are right in the middle of fall freshening, and and uh, that is going well so far. We are not quite halfway done. We've had uh, ten cow ten or twelve cows freshen with a nice mixture of bull calves and heifer calves and uh calves are doing great 
so far, and that has really changed. And I'm not sure if I have talked about this earlier in the year or not, how we do raise those calves. But uh, in in the past, we used to have those calves, the baby calves, would be put in a just a stall in the in the barn, just a regular bank barn type of situation. And it's amazing how things have to get horrible before a farmer is willing to make a change. And that's where we were with calf raising. I could, there was a point in time where I couldn't keep a calf alive if my life depended on it. And it got bad enough that I was willing to make a change. We we put in some super hutches, and we moved those super hutches out in the round in the pasture between batches. So just to back up a little bit, we're spring and fall freshening. So once the spring freshening calves are gone, and they leave the farm in early August, and then we power wash the the super hutches and move them to a different spot, rebed the hutches, and then the new uh, calves come in. Everything's nice and clean. The pasture has had a chance to regrow a little bit, which really helps with parasites later on once the calves are uh, grazing. So pretty excited about the way that's working for us and knock on wood. Uh, maybe this time we'll have to fight some parasites and, and coccidiosis and so forth, but uh, for the most part it's it's fun raising calves this way. Uh, as far as the uh, the region, we are Corn, corn silage is in full swing, and, and we're just we're probably a week to ten days earlier than usual. Um, I can't recall that I have ever cut corn silage on Labor Day, and this is the this is this year we did. So, the corn silage on our farm is done and in the bag. Uh, the fall seedings of alfalfa have been put in into the empty fields of corn stubble. Pretty excited about that. Uh, we like to have our fall alfalfa seedings in the ground by September 20th is sort of the cutoff date. And uh, so that's pretty much for the region. Uh, we're all in that era of, uh, in, that re in that time frame of corn silage being close to done and usually was starting at about this time. So uh, recap the whole year here a little bit. It, it seems like for the most part all has gone well and, and you may think that Everything goes well on this farm, and and that's not the that's not the case. I so mindlessly we so we chopped corn, and the and the the field was close to the barn, and my dry cows were on some pasture. And I thought, well, I'll just let these dry cows on the corn stubble. There was about two days there that I wasn't able to get into the field to work it down for the new seeding of alfalfa. I'll just let them go in there, and they can clean the fence rows and and pick up a little bit of grain here and there. And, so I turned them in, and and uh, I uh, we had more ear loss this year <clears throat> when we were chopping corn than ever, and it was just uh, the, the the stalk was green and had a decent amount of moisture. However, the ear was drying down at a faster rate, and so we lost quite a bit of ears. Not excessive, but anyway, this one dry cow, she was the pig of the bunch, and she is now. We're dealing with grain overload on her, which is the first for this farm. But So those are the things that can go wrong and have gone wrong on the farm. Um, I think she's going to be okay, but we'll see how she, she pulls out of this. So that's the pretty much the regional update. Hey, thanks for that, Marlon. Uh, when you talked ear loss, um, I was actually, my brother-in-law was chopping yesterday, and I saw the same thing with a greener stalk. And... Uh, and a drier ear where you had some ears got knocked off. So is that, is that uncommon out there? It is. It is. We, I can't recall ever seeing this where we've had the ear was, was the husk on the ear was turning brown and the stalk was still a nice dark green. And just looking at the, at the plant, you would say that it's, it's not ready to chop, but the ear was, the husk was brown and you peeled back the husk the kernel was the, the cob or the ear was fully dented and it was just it was amazing we were so we, we run an ag bag and the pressure on that thing usually if, if you can't get your pressure above 500 pounds you're pushing the edge of too much moisture 
that, that stock was nice, dark green, and we were pushing 700, 800 pounds of pressure, which is a nice amount. So first time I've ever saw that. First time I ever saw that. We had one particular field where the ear was, was brown and the, and the stalk was even turning brown. It, was almost, it almost looked like the visual, you would say, uh, it's too dry. And yet we were, and so we were pushing, the pressure was up to eight, 900 pounds. And yet there was, we had a little bit of juice coming out of that bagger. Uh, sort of interesting. It's just been a different year on, on that perspective. So really looking forward to see how this, how this forage, the, the corn silage tests um, with the moisture, the difference in the moisture. I, I have no idea how it's going to test, but I'm kind of, sort of curious. Yeah, very interesting. I'm going to ask some other farmers in the area if they're seeing the same thing or is this kind of an anomaly so um, uh -huh. yep. so did you have good tonnage on your corn we so the corn that was there was phenomenal but uh, overall tonnage was off this is probably one of my weaker years and that all came from germination uh some of those fields we probably should have replanted uh, we plant at about between 26 and 30,000 seeds per acre, and I did not do a, a seed or a, a germination check, but just the visual, I would say we were down in that low, maybe 20,000. And like I said, some of them we should have probably uh, disc down and replanted. We did not. So, and that is where I lost yield. It wasn't the corn that was there. The corn that was there was phenomenal. Um, and it just it just sort of told me again that the planter needs that planter needs to be working correctly, and the germination needs to be there. And and why why was the germination off? We saw that throughout the region. And was it the weather pattern? Uh, we were warm in early May, um, and, and as we got into mid May, we were getting on the dry side. Even into late May, we were getting dry right during that time that corn was germinating and coming out of the ground. And, and I don't know that anybody really had an answer for it. Uh, but I will also say my planter is not working correctly. We had, I've got a uh, John Deere 7000 uh, plateless planter, and that thing is going in the shop this winter. I've got, I've got an appointment made with the local John Deere person that we're just, it was my fault. We're not going to have, we cannot put up with that. I believe that, Whatever you set that planter at, is it 20,000 seeds per acre, is it 30,000? If you can get that consistent um, plant every seven inches, that is where your yield is. If there is no seed there, the yield is totally gone. You have no choice. You have no chance of getting an extra yield. The seed needs to be there. That's the first and foremost um, thing that needs to be in place in order to maximize yield. Usually on this farm, we'll push 26 tons per acre of corn silage. We have done 29. Um, and this year, like I said, we're probably down in that 20 to 22 tons per acre. Now, interesting stuff. You, If you have a long career as a farmer, you get 30 chances to do the plant your corn right, <laughs> which is kind of a depressing way to look at it. <laughs> yeah, it, we, we also tried... Uh, we also tried this year for the first time. We tried a uh, a local repair shop makes a corn weeder, and uh, so this year I used one of those. And uh, I'm not sure. I am not sure. Uh, we'll, we'll see. We'll give it another chance. But I uh, in, in the past we've always just taken a oh, a call emulsion of some kind over the planted corn at about just before the corn emerges basically three, day three or day four. And we go at an angle with, so we've got one of those rolling baskets on the call emulsion, and then there's some, some tines, just like a, a spring tine, I guess you would call it. And we set those spring tines just so it scratches the surface. And we go at an angle, and I think that's the key. It makes a, it drags some of that loose dirt in between the rows, drags it over on top of the actual row, and then the rolling baskets sort of mix the dirt a little bit and just disturbs that whole top, makes for a nice flat field, and then uh, the cultivation goes so much easier. And in the past, we've always just tried to go in with a cultivator at with rolling shields at, uh, oh, five to six leaf stage. And this year, we, we decided we're going to use the uh, 
pine weeder and, and try to, and then maybe just cultivate twice instead of three times. And that's what we did, but I just, the weed pressure was a little bit heavier. Um, and, and yet weed pressure this year was, was heavy. Didn't matter what, what type of, of weed control you used. Uh, we saw lots of weeds throughout the region just from the excess moisture, and that, that's going to go with it. We've had a good corn year, and we've had a excellent forage year, and so if we're going to have those things, we'll probably have a little extra weed pressure as well. Yeah, well, hey, Marlon, I want to thank you so much for your time this morning, um, and it's it's always a really nice time of year when you see that corn being chopped and you have these crisp, clear fall days. So uh, glad to hear I'm not the only one enjoying it. So uh, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Hey, this is Chris Hoffman from North Carolina. It is a nice day. It's probably about 82 degrees. Um, the weather has been pretty rough. Uh, it's been relatively dry for a while. Um, we've, uh, corn was suffering pretty bad and all the neighbors beans and all around suffering. But whenever I reckon hurricane or tropical storm or whatever Fred came through, we got about four inches of rain, which really, really helped. And then we also got some rain out of Ida as well. I think we got three inches out of that, that storm as well. So things are looking up. We, uh, had a pop-up storm this morning. Um, and it was starting to get a little dry and our cough a little bit this evening. So uh, um, right now we've finished chopping our corn silage about two weeks ago. We averaged probably 15 or so tons. I hadn't really averaged it all out. And uh, Sam, I talked to him this morning. They should be finishing up theirs this week. Um, he's, I think he said he's probably around 18 or so. Um, we got, we, you know, he's always getting more rain than us, so he's going to do better. So, uh, but, um, but anyway, guys around here, conventional wise, they're picking corn. There's some guys cutting early beans, us on forest crops. We are, um, planting some oats right now and some different things. See if we can get some fall grazing, hopefully, because we definitely need it. Um, I believe Sam said he had some that was coming up, but, um, you know, things are looking up. Cow production wise, us personally, uh, we're really stale. Um, I've got a few cows calving in now, but not very many. Most of them are going to be calving in December and January. So they're a whole bunch of them ready to go dry. And, um, you know, with it being in the 90s like it has been here lately, you know, cows that are six months bred, they really don't make a whole lot of milk. And uh, with not having really good grass as well. Um, but since we've had these few rains, we have, our grasses have came back out some and it's looking pretty, we're, we're trying to stay optimistic about it. Um, but besides that, you know, as far as crops and everything around here, I mean, it's just, uh, the norm. Um, hopefully, hopefully fall will be here soon and, and then spring will be right around the corner. So we're gonna, we'll just have to skip winter. Well, I'm okay with the whole skipping winter thing, uh, <laughs> if you can make that happen. Nah, uh, I'll try, but I don't think I can do a whole lot about it. Uh, did you do a lot of uh, sorghums or summer annuals this year? Well, we we planted a whole lot more millets um, for our grazing. Um, I kind of st- backed up a little bit on our sorghums because of the uh, sugarcane aphids. Um, We've got our rear end handed to us several times in the last few years. And um, we noticed that the, well, they won't eat millets. So we have planted uh, the BMR um, BMR millet, and we also planted old school brown top, old, I don't know, German millet or whatever it's called, dove millet. Um, we planted it as well. And heck, to be honest, I think it does better than than the BMR millet. The cows seem to want to eat it more than the BMR. But, you know, I like, I really, really like sorghums, but when those aphids come in, you know, they're just sucking all the, you know, all the good stuff out of the plant, and you just got to stay on the ball with them and chop it early. And, yeah, it, it, they can be a real, 
a real drag. Um, now I kind of wonder if, you know, I know they're a sugar cane aphid, but I kind of wonder if we couldn't do more foliars, maybe increase sugar bricks in the plants, make the plants more healthy, that, uh, that we would have less problems with them, but we didn't even tr try to go down that road. Um, as far as us, uh, we graze a lot of crabgrass. Um, if you, if you do the crabgrass at the right dates, you know, it makes a decent baleage, but if, if it's, you know, four inches tall, it's perfect for the cows, but you know, they like to get out in my yard and eat the grass in the yard. That's about how big it is when it needs to be mowed. That, they love it at that stage. Um, you know, we just, as, uh, I heard, uh, Robin Brecken say on the podcast the other week, um, I reckon I listened to it yesterday, actually, uh, you know, plant more what's in the side ditch. Well, there's crabgrass everywhere in the side ditch. And I, it, you know, it goes out through our pastures. We've planted it. It does great. And um, it is kind of a pain in the tail when you plant beans. But, you know, if it's in the corn, as long as there's enough moisture, enough fertilizer, well, fertilization in the soil, it'll grow up underneath it. And we chopped it. Well, actually, we got one field now. We chopped it and then put a fence around it, and we're letting heifers graze it off. So it's actually, it's a blessing and a curse. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, just one of them things you just got to work with and make it happen. Mm -hmm. Do you have Johnson grass? Oh, we do. It can be a real pain. But, but do you like um, that to graze? Yes. For the cows to graze, yes. Um, but what happens is whenever you're on the rotation and you're grazing and you're constantly going over that land all summer, that, that, Johnson grass doesn't it doesn't have the you're cutting it off you know every couple of weeks and it it kills the um, it's pretty much taking all the energy out of rhizomes and so it won't come back out after a couple of years of it it kind of disappears now where okay. we have pro it, you know so it does go okay like that but where we have problems with it is is in our corn you know in places that are away from here away from the dairy that are a little bit harder to graze um you know that's where it starts showing up in our cornfields um but what we have done is <clears throat> far as uh those fields we started putting alfalfa in it so we're mowing them every 28 30 days so that seems to really help out cut down on the johnson grass so after a few years of it and being an alfalfa we'll you know plant it in corn and those johnson grass and even the pigweed numbers are way lower and so that putting that in the rotation seems to be really a uh, positive, mm -hmm. really, really positive. I was just talking to a farmer from Kentucky who his favorite thing to graze is, is uh, Johnson grass said when he turns his cows into a field with Johnson grass, that's the first thing they'll eat. And I thought, well, yep, I'm sure you've sure. got some down yep. there. Oh yeah. And they like it. They really do. Especially if you can get on it knee high or, you know, at the most waist high, even if you mow it off at that time and and wrap it, it makes really good feed at that that stage. But whenever it gets you know headed out, just like any other plant or any other weed or anything, whenever it starts heading out, then you got issues, and hey, you just got to make do with what you got. Um, what one thing last fall um, I planted, you know, we plant big mixes, and last fall I added some kale in on our mix. And, um, didn't think I'd never really seen it all winter or in the spring or nothing. Didn't see it. And, uh, after, after, um, everything started dying off, you know, the ryegrass and the, and the, um, radishes and turnips and the clovers all disappeared. We'd no tilled into it and planted millets in it. Okay. You know, we got a fair stand, not a great stand, but the kale really took off. And, um, he got probably, it was up to knee high. Some of it was waist high when we started grazing it. Them cows absolutely loved that kale because when it got dry, that was really the only thing out there that was still green because it put that massive root going down into the, into the soil. And, uh, I was really impressed with it. Now, right now, uh, it's starting to come out to the end. I reckon it's a year old. Not yet, it's right at a year old now. And it's a lot of it's dying off, and that stuff sure stinks. Ooh, it is oh. terrible stinking. Yeah, uh, it smells like rotten cabbage out in that field. So, but 
the cows ate it all summer. They really, really liked it. So I, that kale was a blessing. We're going to plant more of it this fall. That's sure that's enough. a good tidbit right there, Chris. I want to ask some other people see if they've ever heard of that before. Is it is it like a I, kale for grazing or? I just found it in our cover crop mix, and I was like, ah, oh, let's put some kale in there because in New Zealand, I've done a little reading in New Zealand. That's what they graze their dry cows on. Um, in New Zealand, there's a lot of kale. And there's a couple different varieties. One makes more energy, and one has more protein, and one gets really tall. And and um, I was like, ah. So I seen it in our cover crop mix, and I was like, ah, let's just add this kale to it. And I put a couple pounds in the mix. And I think it's just a cover crop kale. Same thing as what we put in your garden is what I think it is. Hmm. So I was really impressed with it, to be honest. And it put some massive roots. Unbelievable how big them roots were, how far down they went into the ground. Unreal. It was several feet they went down because I pulled some out. Oh, wow. Just huge roots. Absolutely. And, you know, and then it stayed, it stayed green this summer when it got so dry. So I'm kind of mm-hmm. like, huh, it's quite interesting. Huh? We're going to have to do some more, try some more research with it. Now, they would not be very hardy in the winter, like they winter kill, right? I think so. I think, you know, like a radish and all those in winter kill, but. So yeah. I don't know, you know, last winter it didn't get like incredibly cold here. So I don't think we had as much winter kill as what we have had in the past. I don't know if it would make it through the winter like in Wisconsin or Ohio. I don't think it would. Because I don't know what lives up there during that time of year. I mean, heck, everything Not dies. The only thing that lives up there is cows in, in the barn and people in the house, right? Pretty much it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a I mean, ghost it's town. So cold, right? It's a ghost town, Zach. Yeah. So, well hey chris Sorry, but, i really really appreciate you taking the time it's i know it's a busy time of year and you know you're done with corn silage and kind of ahead of where we are up here but uh i really appreciate it i had no problem thank you and you have a good one morning from uh upstate new york this is eric Byler in krogan new york uh we have a cool fall day here today nights are getting down in the 50s and days we're seeing 60s, 70s. I think today we have a forecasted high of 66. So it's definitely fall. It's setting in here. And um, we're starting to see a few farms chopping corn, opening up fields. Um, we've been pretty wet, though, through July and August. We've, we've had a really wet July and August for this area. And that was coming out of a dry June. We had an extremely dry, dry June. There was People, some of the grazers starting to plant sorghum sedan and annuals to supplement their grazing. And then as soon as July hit, we just, we got rain right through July, right through August. And people were doing the best they could to make hay in and, and the windows we had. We were fortunate on our farm to catch windows and, and get quite a bit of hay in at pretty good quality too. So we were, we were grateful for that. Um, field work update. Right now we're... Um, we're just getting ready to mow forth cutting uh, grass hay, and then we're going to try to get manure spread while the weather's still warmer before it gets any any wetter. Um, typically, we do spread a little bit later, but this year being as wet as it is, we're trying to just get the hay off quick and get manure spread and get out of the fields because um, I'm a little worried <laughs> the rain's going to continue. Um, so yeah, this year has been a little interesting field work wise uh, with, you know, I think like a lot of people in the country were having issues getting equipment or parts. Parts in general haven't been bad for me. I was trying to get another another forage wagon this year for this fall. And um, they said there's, I checked with two different companies. There wasn't even a chance to get a new one um, till late fall after corn or next spring. So there's just, with all the supply chain um, disruption and, you know, just missing, you know, I, I think they weren't able to get some of the parts for the wagons. They just couldn't turn out wagons. So that's been a little interesting this year. Like I said, overall parts haven't been bad, but for guys that are trying to get new equipment, um, it's, it's definitely a challenge this year. And then because that used equipment's pretty high also in this area, which was the only reason I was going to buy another piece of equipment is the trade-in value is just extremely high for, for used equipment. Um, so pretty typical, typical fall here though, typical, uh, I mean, so far apart from the wet, 
the weather wise um it's just starting to cool down and hoping we'll have another couple weeks of uh decent weather our corn um with the dry june that we had our once we got our corn in the ground we planted into pretty dry ground um and our corn stayed pretty stagnant through june and then it took off in july um but i think just sitting there in june so long um we're a little behind on maturity for our corn so i'm really hoping for a couple more weeks um before we can get frost and most of the, most of the farmers around here would say you know anytime after labor day you can see a killing frost so um, you're usually safe through Labor Day. Anytime after that, we could see a killing frost. So I'm just hoping it holds out for two or three weeks so our corn can mature and it'll make a lot better better quality forage for us. Um, we have we have about 100 acres of corn to put in this fall. Um, we might snap some of it, might combine some of it if it if it makes it. Um, if not, we'll just have a lot of silage and some carryover for next year. Um, grazing update, there's been a lot of grass this year. Um, for the farmers that were planting annuals, I'm not sure they would have needed them uh, because, because of July and August being uh, so wet, having so much rain, there's, there's really been a lot of grass for grazing. Um, so I did, I know one of, I had mentioned on another podcast that one of the goals I had, you know, when you start farming, you know, we're only two and a half years in, the amount of goals and the checklist you have is endless. And sometimes it feels like you don't check many boxes at the end of a month or end of six months. And one of our goals for this year was to at least start getting the dry cows and the heifers rotated because we do have a pasture for them and a little feedlot area. But I really wanted to start moving them through and, um, you know, giving them breaks the pasture that we have isn't real well set up nor big enough to really supply a whole lot of feed. And so we took one of the crop fields and we planted uh, sorghum sand in it this year, right at the beginning of June. And so we were able to graze that and move the heifers through that. The heifers and dry cows went through that and they're just getting ready to hit it a second time. So it was nice to be able to check that off my list as, you know, it was one of our goals for this summer. And uh, it was really satisfying to, to see these these animals they had just been confinement animals before the winter and then they you know they had a pasture but they weren't rotating at all so and they learned extremely quickly uh, i was telling mike just a minute ago that six or seven days in they were coming to my call um, i'd call them and take down the poly wire and i did that each time i move them about six or seven days in i called them they came running up to the poly wire and i took it down and they went charging in so it was so, it's something I really miss. I had been farming organically previously, um, and so and grazing, and so I really missed the grazing. So it was, it was just a, it was good for my good for my spirit to see that and to check check that box. Um, overall, our local report for feed here, uh, our I'm still conventional. I always remind you of that, but I'm still conventional, and our grain is our grain price is coming down a little bit. Um, August 1st was our um, two-year mark. So this year, we have one year to our lands um, completely transition on the home farm. And then a rental farm I have, which is 60 acres, is actually already certifiable. So I'm hopefully turning in the paperwork uh, within the next week for that. So the crops that I'll take off this fall will be certified organic off that farm. Um, so our grain's coming down a little bit in price. Our milk price was not great. Um, it was like just over $17 a hundred weight this last month. And I had mentioned in the last call that our co-op was dumping a lot of milk. Um, that's improved a little bit. We aren't dumping as much anymore. Uh, I think actually we haven't dumped in three weeks. Um, the last I had talked to um, my hauler, he was saying he hadn't thought we dumped in any in three weeks. So we found some other plants to get milk into our co-op did they found some other plants to get milk into so uh good news there we're we're not dumping like we were as much um and then in my region in my region northern new york here we most most farmers have an overabundance of hay this year so there's a lot of bales around for sale uh, which for my farm is great i would take a wet year on this sandy ground 
I'd take a wet year over a real dry year because I just burn up on a dry year. Um, so that's kind of the overall crop report uh, for hay. And for corn, uh, looks like there's going to be quite a bit of good corn out there this year. Um, with the dry spring and the warm spring, we had a pretty dry warm spring. Uh, there's a lot of corn in the ground early, and looking it's looking like it's going to mature well. Um, there should be a lot of silage and a lot of good grain corn in this area. So um, overall feed report's great. My only fear is that a lot of when there's a lot of feed, sometimes the tendency is to start milking more cows and overcrowding barns, and that just doesn't help our oversupply of milk at all. So <laughs> that's the downside. You know, the, the I'm glad to see all the feed on our farm. I'm just hoping that we don't get an over a um, oversupply of milk. That's about it for upstate New York right now, Mike. Yeah, thanks for that, Eric. Uh, I had a, a question here, and when you said you're going to certify your farm, is are you you're going to certify your home farm next year as well, um, or and then are you looking for an organic milk market, or what is the plan? Yeah, so right now um, I'm going to certify the neighbors, my rental farm. Uh, it's a 60 acre farm. So at least I'll have certified crops off of that farm. Um, my hope is that the corn coming off that farm this year um, will be some corn, some corn I can use as carryover, you know, like late fall next year, uh, or sorry, late summer, early fall. If I were to find a market, that would be certified feed. So then if I had extra T3 feed, I could just get rid of it. Um, and I would actually mm -hmm. have certified feed waiting on farm that whenever I found a market, I could be feeding that. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, my hope is still to be able to buy a herd in maybe with a market. Um, if not, I think I'm just going to you know hold out and get my whole farm certified until I can get a market, you know, mm -hmm. to continue on. Um, milking conventionally, but keeping my farm, the land certified organic. Um, yeah, my hope is still to get a herd, though, to sell my herd mm -hmm. and get another herd. And hopefully, it would come to the market. Now, were were any of the organic farms in your area there? Would any of those have been affected by the news that came out about farmers getting dropped in a year, or was that all further east? No, so that's north of me and east. Um, I believe some of the farms that were dropped by Horizon were way up north in the county north of me, St. Lawrence County. Um, that was the rumor. I actually don't know the exact location of those farms, but they would be probably an hour and a half from me, two hours from me. But no one real local, apart from, you know, I'm sure the Horizon guys in this area uh, are nervous because that's a little too close to home, you know. It's, sure. Um, yeah, it's devastating for that whole area, for Maine and Vermont. And I really, I, feel awful for those farmers i'm just really hoping that you know they they were given a year i'm really hoping something works out where they can continue get a market somewhere else or whatever it may be um because that you know in some of those areas um that's the end of dairy and it's really sad to see it is yeah and i was so i know a, a fellow her um uh, dairyman who's a horizon producer and i was talking to him about it um because i said what you know what's the deal can can some of these guys move because some of these guys would pick up their farm and move um if they could if it meant they could keep their market because i believe horizon owns the processing plant in new york and so if those guys could move down to new york and find land around new york it wouldn't surprise me if some of them would you know if it meant they could continue to dairy but he didn't know if that was an option they had or not you know, like I, I was curious whether Horizon would transfer that, you know, their their base, their active base, as we would call it in Organic Valley, if they would transfer their active base, um, if they moved a farm and came down and started yeah. you know, producing milk in New York. Yeah, I haven't heard I that. I was just know the answer to that. Mm -hmm. I was just kind of curious because you know you hear a lot of rumblings and you don't know what to believe. So I thought, well, maybe you'd heard something in your area, but uh, yeah, well, no, I've only I, heard the same, just rumors about you know the devastate, you know. The devastating news and, and that many farms being dropped yeah yeah that's terrible so well hey it's it's good to hear a, a positive report uh, you know 
pretty good crop year up there. It's always good, but it's like you say, it's there's always then the the other side of now overproducing and flooding the market. But um, <laughs> I really, I'm hoping that won't happen. But we'll yeah, see. exactly. Yep. So, well, hey, Eric, I really appreciate you taking the time. I know it's a busy time of year. Corn silage is in, going wide open in my region, and it sounds like it's coming your way. So, thanks for taking the time. Yep. Thanks, Mike. Take care. Hi, Mike. It's uh. It's uh, early September. Um, last time we talked, I think was early July. Uh, so continuing on uh, our last one, it's been the driest year I've ever seen in my life, and the hottest year I've ever seen in my life. We had, I think we had just got done with a heat wave last time we talked. You know, it was close to 112 degrees. I think one day, and really crashed the cows and milk pretty hard after a pretty good spring production wise, and just basically killed all of our grass and that's all we grow is grass so um, it was pretty uneventful since then uh, basically all of our ground that we can reach with our cows has turned into grazing ground what is left there because there wasn't enough to take a third cutting um, so we, I think we just got done with second cutting last time we talked and the crop was only about 40 percent of the year before second cutting we did take it a little earlier about eight days earlier but um I, it was starting to go backwards so i think it would have been worse even waiting that's why we, we cut a little earlier it was starting to senesce and kind of dry up on the stem so um i think last year at this time we hadn't even fed any of this year's winter feed and we've been feeding winter feed for Oh, almost, uh, yeah, since mid-June already. Um, it's going to be pretty hard to get our dry matter requirements for for pasture this year. And uh, it's just, it's it's been crazy. So um, everything kind of looks like a desert. We finally did get a little rain in the last two weeks, but it's been a quarter inch here, you know, an eighth of an inch here, and not really enough to really do anything. So we're... Uh, Almost all of our feed is coming from uh, our w winter feed storage. So it's uh, dwindling quickly. Um, yeah, production has continued to be tough to, to get back from uh, what what we were getting. I ended up buying a semi of Eastern Washington alfalfa to try to uh, coax the cows back into milking a little better. I think it's helped, helped them hold their milk through, you know, we've had a couple more pretty good heat waves but it really hasn't improved it um so yeah it's been a tough summer and um it's been a while since we've had one of these here so i guess that's just how it goes yeah it's and and that the heat wave was really widespread wasn't it um yeah as i understand most of washington and oregon i don't know if it hit california at the same time or or not but um as far as i know washington and oregon was really really hot at that time california is always getting heat waves so i don't know how that correlated with what we got but um yeah and then obviously our irrigation water too uh, we don't have a lot we water out of the ditch and it works better for us when we have a wet year because we can complement the rain um, on a dry year, we don't have enough water to really make a difference. So, and then the water actually flows out of the ditch or goes into the ground. So we barely hit 20 acres once and then we didn't have any water. Um, so, but even the guys that have irrigate really heavily, you can tell driving by that their crops weren't near what they were last year. Um, a lot of them quit irrigating their grass and started irrigating their corn. Um, because it really wasn't doing much for their grass. Now, will you be able to get a variance from the certifier if you can't reach your dry matter from pasture? I hope so. Um, <laughs> I mean, there, there was nothing we could really do about it, right? So, um, I, I don't know. I haven't done the calculations yet, but it's going to be close. I mean, I, I know last year we were way over. We were at almost 60% of dry matter during the grazing season. So there is some cushion there. 
Um, it'll be interesting to see once I sit down and and figure out what it actually is. And hopefully we get a big shot of rain here soon, and then you can get some later fall pasture. Yeah, it's been uh, it's it's kind of crazy. I I just talked to Eric Byler from New York to get his update, and you know they're wet. You know, yeah, it's just like boy, if we could just share uh, some of this weather, and then then I feel yeah. guilty because we've had just the most amazing year here um, that I can remember. Um, we have mowed our grass every week this year. And even here through August, we got rain. We've got pasture that I don't know what to do with. So it's just the, the these microclimates are just crazy right now. Yeah. And see, that's how last year was for me. So, I mean, you win some, you lose some, right? I mean, last year, I don't remember a year being any better than last year forage wise. So luckily I had a lot of uh, stored up feed from last year too. Wow. Well, Hey Corby, I, I know it's a busy time of year and, and I appreciate you taking the time to give us this update. Um, really appreciate it. Always like hearing from all the different regions, uh, see where we are with weather and crops and all that. And, and the, the poor West coast has really been taking a beating this year. So, uh, good luck in the future. I hope you get rains and, uh, you know, hopefully things will get better. Thanks, Mike. This episode was brought to you by Soil Biotics, providing full circle improvement for soil health 